90 Miles from Needles is brought to you by generous support from people just like you. You can join your ranks by going to 90milesfromneedles.com slash donate. Are we going far? Should I bring my camel back? Or? Um, I don't really have much intention to go far, but... So that means pack five gallons. Yeah, right. Chris doesn't have much intention of going very far. <laughs> for 90 Miles from Needles, the Desert Protection Podcast, with your hosts, Chris Clark and Alicia Pike. The giant saguara, monarch of the cactus family and trademark of the Southwest. Believe me, this is where the poet and a man comes out. A warm sun, a tang of sagebrush and greasewood, Weird saguaro cactus, bracing air. I wonder what folks back home are doing. Shoveling snow? Or putting on tire chains? New York, Arizona. Pretty co-eds from the University of Arizona take a riding lesson through the world's largest cactus forest near the city. The government has made this picturesque stretch of desert land a national monument to save the giant cacti for future generations. Some of the saguaro are a thousand years old. It's a great place to learn how to ride, for it's a choice between the comforts of a saddle or landing on a lot of little cacti. Hey, thanks for joining us here at 90 Miles from Needles, the Desert Protection Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Pike. And I'm your host, Chris Clark. And we are talking today about the giant cactus of Arizona, celebrated in song and story and corporate logo, the saguaro. Now, I should say that despite what you just heard in that newsreel, it's unlikely in the extreme that any saguaro has ever lived for a thousand years. That's a bit of folklore. But it's really unsurprising that a plant as striking as the saguaro has generated some folklore around it. In today's episode, we'll be talking a little bit about that folklore, along with some science and cultural affection for the saguaro. This is the first of a two-parter. Part two will involve talking to indigenous people about their relationship with the saguaro. That'll be coming your way in a few weeks, so stay tuned. For now, let's hop in the old cross trek and head to Brenda, Arizona on a very hot day to visit some of those iconic critters we call saguaros. All right, so we are outside of Brenda, Arizona, and we are in a bit of BLM land. There are a lot of saguaros and ironwoods, Palo Verdes, Ocotillos, sparse creosote that is not looking all that healthy and the saguaros are definitely showing signs of wear and injury behemoth so big oh yeah okay shall we stroll yeah let's check this stuff out around within a short stone's throw of this fence and then maybe check out on the other side of the road there's a very dead saguaro. Oh, so these are the ribs. Yeah. I've read these are used for building materials. Look at that. Huh? They feel very strong. Yeah, it's got to hold up several tons of water. I love how this is a combination of woody and fibrous. Mm-hmm. Instead of just a sponge. It's like a stick house version of a cactus. Yeah. <laughs> And the, among the last things to survive intact are the spines. Yeah, piles yeah. of them. Got just the areoles all over. Cactus areolas. It's a tidy pile. Yeah. Well, it looks like the really interesting ones to look at are over here. Many, many armed mature saguaros. We're walking through a creosote flat that is absolutely thick with desiccated cow shit. Look at this trail. This looks like the cow trail. Yeah. They all come in on this. All right, I'm going to take this way. It looks like there's another one. Yeah. You can go in front. <laughs> Sorry to start trail bossing. No, yeah, it's, it's totally fine. I know I'm not supposed to break away from you or anyone I'm hiking with in the desert, but I still, it's 
still making rookie moves after all these years. Hey, breaking away and walking five feet in a different direction, I think. Is Have totally... you not watched enough Westerns gone wrong? Where, yeah, dude takes a left, dude takes a right, dude who took a right at the junction. Never done seen or heard from him again. Yep. He just vanished. Separation rapid all I over again. I certainly know that's an episode of Bonanza. Hey, somebody's been camping here by this ironwood. A little fire ring, that's nice. Let's go take a look at these many arm guys. Man, there's a lot of Gila woodpecker holes that are probably on occasion resided in by elf owls. At least I like to think that. So even this new chute on this side, which might be only, you know, I don't know, 50 years old, it's definitely seen better days. Got all split open, it's got cavities. Bunch of dead flower buds. All right, let's have a look around for owl pellets. See who really lives in those holes. Oh, there's a spent fruit, so they're getting pollinated a little at least. Oh, we got a nice pack rat midden going over here. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Man, there's some severe paraderm damage. I don't know if that's what you'd call it on a swaro, but... Yeah. The critters have done chewed through to the wood, and it's still standing strong. Of course, it gets windy as soon as we start recording. Not seeing any owl pellets of any kind. The pack rats have been busy, though. Yep. This is a really impressive saguaro right here. It's got maybe nine good-sized arms on it. And it's taking nurse tree from the nursery to the nursing home. Yeah. It's using two different branches on either side of it to create a structure. And it's actually sandwiched. You can see a little bit of strain here. You can see the abrasion where mm -hmm. it's been moving yep. and growing. That's something. Those are chunky arms. Oh, yep, there's uh, ten, nine and ten. Okay, yeah. I would be thrilled to have any of these arms as a single plant in my yard. Right. Oh, here's a baby over here, hiding in the shade of the nurse tree. Oh, that's great. Just maybe up to my belly button. So about a yard, I'd say. Some nice cottony growth at the crown. Looks real happy. So let's just walk over to that little clump and then... We'll... Classic Chris wants to walk deeper into the desert yep. when it's above 105. But we are going to turn around and head back to the car <laughs> after this clump. Alicia's shirt is still moist. The timer is not up yet. Onward ho. What'd you call me? <laughs> Ow! Oh, prickles, they got I'm me. I'm sorry about that. Could have warned I, you. I walked right into it. I could have warned you. My bad. I didn't. I, yeah, you don't need to warn me. I got eyes. I know what it is. Yeah, I think these are the selfie saguaros right here. Oh, Chris. Selfie saguaros. Yep. Listen to you. Yeah, these are looking okay. Healthy enough. Not a lot of holes. No damage at the trunk base, where it's all woody. Some exposed root from the uh, water flow action of where it's living, but it seems fine with that. Very fine with that. The ribs are so pronounced. Yeah, it could use a drink for sure. But it's not in danger yet. It's still got a fair amount of moisture inside there. They will get very, very accordion-y. Yeah, they're wrinkling. The way it buckles and wrinkles under the weight of the arm or... Yeah, that, that one is really dehydrated. You can see like the folds are almost touching each other. Yeah. Uh, this is like the perfect illustration of the nurse tree. Yeah. Let's grab a photo. Saguaro with three arms and it's a good 20 feet tall and it's surrounded by a Palo Verde. And the Palo Verde has probably given it shelter for its entire life. Oh, they're growing right next to each other. Friends. For life. It looks, that suara looks real thirsty, though. You mentioned the ribs on the other yeah. one. These ribs are not only nearly touching, but they're dehydrated, deflated. They look thin. So the saguaro is saying to the Palo Verde, 
Chris, why didn't you bring enough water? <laughs> Sharing is caring, don't you know? You want to check out that last green one in the ironwood? Because yeah. that looks so good. And then we'll stop finding out what's around the next creek bend. Oh, that's nifty. This one's got a unique looking growing formation here. Yep. It's like segmented and the segments are growing segments. That has had some damage done to it over the decades. And it just keeps keeps living and growing pieces of itself back. And that's awesome. Well, they certainly are impressive. The tallest cacti in the United States, right? Yep. What is wrong with you going out to stand in the sun? You're a true desert rat, I tell you. The shade of the ironwood, ironwood is so uh, inviting. It is really nice, yeah. To see you standing out there in the full sun is like, what's wrong with you? It's a very tidy area, very browsed. There's, there's clearly a lot of activity around here. I wonder if it's, I mean, there's cattle poop, but what else is cruising around here? You got those uh, rascally coyotes. Coyotes, definitely pack rats, almost certainly rabbits and jackrabbits. I love how there just keeps seeming to be another tree and another tree that has a really great cluster of yeah. swarrows growing in it. It's the total nurse tree symbiosis going on out here. Yeah, there's a lot of standalones, but it's pretty clear. Look at how many there are in that tree. It yep. looks like one, two, three, at least four individuals, if not more. Just really love being in a place where there are saguaros with many arms off in the distance and you just like looking at them and thinking about how long they've stood there and what different kinds of stuff they've seen. There's a very tall dead one with no arms next to a very tall alive one with no arms. And I'm going to do everything in my power to not suggest that we go over there. thinking it's too hot. For the last month or so, lots of stories have been hitting the news about mature saguaros across the state of Arizona dropping dead because of the heat. Though it makes for attractive headlines, the heat wave that we're presently enduring and its toll on saguaros is just one of the problems saguaros face in the 21st century. As far back as the early 1940s, scientists worried whether saguaros might be on the decline, especially in what was then the newly established Saguaro National Monument. In among the stories on dying saguaros this past few weeks, we saw news of a long-term study on the cacti in Saguaro National Park and the retirement of a couple of scientists, Tom Oram and Nancy Ferguson, who for the last 40 years had been continuing a study of the National Park's cacti begun in the 1940s. The reporter who wrote that story, Henry Breen of the Arizona Daily Star, sat down with Chris to chat about Tom and Nancy and their study which may well be the longest-term study of a native plant species on record. Let's listen. My name's Henry Breen. I'm a reporter with the Arizona Daily Star newspaper down here in Tucson, Arizona. Before that, I was in Las Vegas for about 20-odd years, uh, working for the Las Vegas Review-Journal, where I covered water and the environment. And we definitely appreciated your work there. So what attracted you to the story of Tom Oram and Nancy Ferguson? 
Oh, wow. Where to start? For one thing, I, I hadn't actually met them before, but and I wish I had gotten connected with them before they stopped doing this survey, the, the Swirl survey that, that they did for decades. They stopped actually doing it a year ago. So I didn't actually get to see them in action, but I heard they'd been given an award by the Park Service for their scientific lifetime achievement. So I was introduced to them that way. But Tom and Nancy are both devoted scientists, but they're also this adorable married couple who finish each other's sentences and riff on each other. Tom and Nancy spent about a little over 40 years doing an annual survey of all the swirl cactuses on six 10-acre plots in Swirl National Park. These were survey plots that were set up in the early 40s, and they picked up and carried on this annual study. They would go out there every year, and they would count every saguaro. They would log saguaro deaths. They would add new baby saguaros to their survey, and they would go look at every single cactus once a year and just chart how it was doing. And when did they start doing this? Sounds like it was roughly the 80s. Yeah, so Tom did his first, I believe, in 1978 or 79. And then Nancy joined him in the field a couple of years later. They were married in 1980. So she joined him a couple of years after that. He started doing it with a guy named Stan Alcorn, another researcher who did it for 40 years himself. They overlapped. They did it together until 1999 when he passed away. And then they took it over for him and did it for another 20 years after that. So as I understand it, the origins of the study happened in a kind of different context than we're facing now. Something that I've read about before, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the study was originally intended to work out. Yeah, the early 40s were a a pretty desperate time. Um, Back then, it was Saguaro National Monument. It wasn't a national park yet, and it only included the eastern district of the park uh, as it stands now, which is over on the eastern side of Tucson and the Rincon Mountains, or at the base of the Rincon Mountains. Um, And so this national monument was established, I think, in 1933 on that patch of land. And one of the first things that researchers discovered out there was it appeared to be a bunch of adult saguaros and no recruitment, no babies coming along. And they started to worry that they just established a saguaro national monument on a patch of land where the saguaros were going to go extinct. So there was a panic mode to try and find out whether there was going to be a future for saguaros on on this new national monument. So they launched this study and they did some just crazy Hail Mary, World War II style stuff out there. There was one, there was a, there's a bacterial rot that saguaros get and they were noticing that in some of the soros out there, and they were worried that it was like Dutch Elms disease. Right. So they decided to try and see if they could put a stop to it. They picked out, I think it was like a 320-acre plot of soros, and they went in and they cut down every single soro with signs of bacterial rot and bulldozed them into trenches and burned them with kerosene, something you probably wouldn't see in a national park these days. No. And there was just this desperate effort to try and halt this horrible disease. Turned out they were wrong about about what it was, thankfully, but that was the sort of thing, that's a backdrop for why they started doing these surveys and bringing in people to try and keep track of what was going on with the Soros on an annual basis. That's where this survey began, was with that sort of thing. Presumably that bacterial rot stopped being as much of a factor in the population dynamics at Soaro? It's still a factor from what Tom and Nancy and other experts have told me, but it's more it's more akin to something that happens late in life with Soros in, in large part. The data, as they've collected, has shown that if Soros live past a certain point, they tend to live a long time. And then obviously mortality swoops up as the older they get. They essentially, it's something that happens to them in old age a lot of the time. They'll get this bacterial rot near the end of their lives and it'll finish them off. So like pneumonia, pretty much. Sure. Like that. Yeah. 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 I've taken a look at one of the papers that Tom and Nancy published, but I wonder if there's a coherent trend that they noticed as they were doing this 40 years project of documenting the lives of these saguaros, which it sounds like they got to know really well. I mean, 60 acres over 40 years, that's some deep familiarity with a piece of landscape. Absolutely. And they got almost personally acquainted with individual plants to the point where they didn't use GPS devices. They would go out and they'd find their plots by recognizing individual plants and saying, okay, we're here. And they knew them by their numbers. And Nancy even joked that there's different size classes for saguaros that they move up through. And when they get to be, I think it's over six feet tall, they graduate to the next size class. So for a while there, they were actually taking graduation photos of some of the saguaros on their plots. She said they stopped doing that, but they did that for a while. They would take what she called graduation photos. But Yeah, they got personally acquainted with some of these plants. That's one of the things about 
that's that I find so amazing about Saguaros. I, I grew up in the Sonoran Desert, so I've been around Saguaros my whole life, and it's because they look like a maybe a human figure. Um, mm -hmm. They have personality and they have an individual identity to an extent. But yeah, so uh, over the long term, like I said, they started this study when things were looking pretty bleak for recruitment of Saguaros in, in the park. And that went on in the early days of the study. They didn't want him for decades. The poor guy who they took a study over for, I think, 20 years, he would go out and he would almost never find a baby Saguaro the whole time he would be out there. This It was really bleak looking. Um, eventually, they began to see that trend reverse itself to a bit. Uh, I think when they started in 1942, they counted 1,500 Saguaros on these uh, 60 acres. Since then, in the decades since, they've been replaced by 600 Saguaros. Mm -hmm. So obviously, there's a, a pretty big decline. And I, one of the things that's interesting to me about this is that there's still so much about the Saguaro that, that they're still learning. And I think one of the conclusions they've come to is that part of this might just be how Saguaros operate. That for desert plants, one of the ways you survive is by living a long time so that you can make it through these bad spots of long dry spells and still reproduce. A swirl cactus has a reproductive life that might go 100 years. Mm -hmm. So you figure you can live through a few droughts and reproduce successfully if you live long enough. So that's one of the things that they came to believe. I think we're probably also seeing some feedback from longer droughts, more extreme weather events that we're causing because of climate change. So I think teasing some of that stuff out is what will what they'll need to do, the people who take on this survey in the future will need to do as we move forward with this thing. But we're probably seeing some of that too. I think there was a couple of 10-year periods during the time they've been doing the survey that were among the driest in centuries in the Sonoran Desert. That's maybe what we have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Soros, have, Soros have been living through some of these longer dry spells. Yeah. It strikes me as something very similar to what we're looking at out here, though, obviously, some of the particulars are very different. But with the Western Joshua tree, which we've covered a bunch, the attempts in California to protect it were very much looking at a likely long decline and actually potential extirpation from actually potential extirpation from Joshua Tree National Park. And it's just interesting that a lot of the threats that are identified, drought, the wildfire issue, et cetera, just seems like there's a lot of parallels there. I've, you know, often thought of saguaros and Joshua trees as sort of spiritually related to each other. Sure. Yeah, and, and in my career, I've had the pleasure of being able to live in both the Sonoran and the Mojave Desert and develop a relationship with both the saguaro and the, the Joshua tree that I, I found really rewarding. You mentioned the the fire issue and things. Something else I think that's interesting about what they've studied is that when they first started studying the saguaros in this area, the monument had been established and some of the external threats human caused external threats began to be eliminated. Things like coming into the forest and cutting down nurse trees for firewood or grazing cattle. And then ranchers, this one I didn't, wasn't familiar with, but ranchers killing predators to protect their herds, which led to an explosion of rodents that weren't being controlled by predators. And the rodents were eating the baby saguaros. So some of those threats have been eliminated now that the land is protected within a park. Something else Tom and Nancy documented, you could really begin to see that those early threats have been eliminated. So now what they're, what they're seeing in subsequent decades is more related to things like drought. And it's a little easier to get some of the feedback, some of the background noise out of what they're seeing. I think the big thing that struck me about this story is that it seems like the kind of labor of love that you should see a lot throughout the desert in various different places, whether it's Tucson or St. George or whatever. And you just don't see that. So one of the things that startled me the more I learn about the desert over the last 15 or 20 years is that we really don't know what's out there a lot of the time. That's changing somewhat because the desert's getting more interesting for people that are doing like graduate work. Or, But an 80-year-long longitudinal study, they don't happen, right? It's fascinating to me that it's essentially people's commitment and determination and strength of will that makes this happen. And we're talking here about a plant that is so charismatic and so iconic to the Sonoran Desert that it's got a national park established in its name and in its for its protection. And we still it still takes this retired couple researchers to to carry on a study like this because it's the National Park Service has limited resources and they've done some science work and they're doing some science work out there. But yeah, even the plants that we've established parks for, like the Joshua tree and the saguaro, we're still learning about it. I, 
think that's interesting. If it was a plant that we had some sort of commercial or industrial use for, we'd know a lot more about it. If it was something we cultivated, we'd know a lot more about it. But yeah, this is new to science is to study something just for the sake of studying it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that when I first got into this line of work, there is a whole lot of peer-reviewed literature on Mojave yuccas, and that's apparently because cattle like to eat them. And so you can find discussions of the nutritive value and whether or not there's any kind of pharmacological effect and how you can get them to grow faster and all this kind of stuff. And that's the one species that I can think of that pe people have really paid attention to in the desert for any length of time. Saguaros and Joshua trees are good for attracting tourists and not much else. You mentioned one of the issues that occupies a lot of time in my work life, which is funding for the Park Service. This study is being taken up by Park Service botanists. What do you see as the forecast for this being able to continue for another 5 or 10 or 20 years? I think that the prognosis is probably, at least in the near term, it's in very good hands. So one of the people that's taking it over is a longtime park biologist by the name of Don Swan, who's been at Swaro for decades and worked fairly closely with Tom and Nancy and is a natural guy to take it over. He's, I think he's getting ready to retire, but I suspect he'll probably continue. And he's got a, a younger researcher who's he's established as the lead for the study. And I think, I think it's got some momentum now. And I think the fact that it's now got this sort of reputation, this prestige of being this maybe longest running study of its kind in the Park Service will help it to continue its momentum. I think it's got the staying power now. I'm hopeful that they'll keep it going. It would be just a, a tragedy to let a, a data set that's been kept this long fade away. One of the really interesting things that Nancy told me, and I hope they at least do this much, is that in spite of the fact they've been doing this for 80 years, they still don't have the entire lifespan of a single plant, full right. lifespan of a single because these things live so long. But if they keep going for another 50, 80 years or whatever it's going to take, they could literally follow one from establishment to its full life and its death and get a real clear picture in one-year increments of the entire lifespan of a single saguaro, which would be kind of an amazing thing to do. And she's hopeful that it'll happen. And I think I am too. That's great. And Maybe we'll be able to wrangle a spot in the van as the park biologist goes out and surveys next time somebody's out there. Yeah, I'll bet they would be happy to have you out there. Yeah. Good road trip and a good time of year to be down here, too. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Henry, thank you for joining us on a weekend when I know you have a pressing deadline. Really appreciate the few minutes of your time to talk about this. And please keep writing. We will keep reading. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's like, it's not just about the saguaro. It's about the saguaro and its relationship with all these other plants. Yeah. Ironwoods, Palo Verdes, mesquites. Probably smoke trees in some places. It's time to start walking back. Yes. My shirt is dry and my water is hot. Or I can at least moisten my shirt if we want to go look at more saguaros. Get my cold water bottle. Here's a saguaro using a creosote as a nurse plant. They're so tall. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so awesome. I just really, really like them. Yeah. Photos really do not do it justice. To stand next to one of these behemoths is just... You got to crank that neck all the way back. Oh. Look at that. Hip fox, maybe? Possible, yeah. Badger, maybe? Badger, uh, rabbit... Kit foxes would tend to be a little bit narrower, but I don't think that that's not qualified. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little short, but even for a hair, it would, I don't know. Always so much conjecture on desert hills. 90 Miles from Needles, the Desert Protection Podcast. We don't know. Could be, we don't know. Could be. Okay, let's keep recording, but head up. That way in the car a little bit. Okay. All right. You crank that AC up. Oh, air conditioning is so nice when it is 107 degrees out. Oh, that feels much better. This is just such a beautiful scene. Ocotillos and the rocky outcropping across the highway. Scrubland all around. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous, darling. Just gorgeous. 
10 years to grow its first inch, I think is what I read. Yeah. What a slog. You got desert tortoise who are on a similar track where they can't mate or do, you know, do their life's purpose until they're eight to 10 years old. Yeah. It's a lesson we've got to take from nature is the slog is the journey. It takes a long time to get to where you're going. Something about the mountains in Arizona, in western, southwestern Arizona especially, I mean, they're just sublimely forbidding looking. Majestic and difficult at yeah. the same time. That's me. <laughs> All right. Looking at some of these swarrows that are growing in the trees and they're all damaged and they don't look beautiful like the classic swarrow. But does that make them any less of a cactus? No, they're still doing their job. They're still contributing. They're still a part of this planet. God, this hillside is fucking gorgeous. Yeah. Cafe with a swarrow logo. With a swarrow growing through the roof. Did you see that? I didn't. They cut a hole in the roof for a swarrow that was growing on the corner. Chris has got to turn around for that. But to get a second view of this rocky That's hill. That's amazing. It looks like an M.C. Escher in nature. Oh, look at that. You are right. Yeah, look at that. It's right there on the corner. Yeah. Of the building. Got just a vent. That's fantastic. Nobody can argue with this place calling themselves Black Rock Village. Seriously, because Black Rocks everything abound. Everything is built out of black rocks. The volcanic rock from across the street, or non-volcanic rock, we're not saying what it is, because we don't know. We don't know. We're not going to say we know. Not today. Nope. Oh, there's a helicopter landing pad. This place is fancy. The glamping. Helipad. Glamping, says the, bi the bitter. Desert Defender. Yep. Overburdened with glamping projects to swat down like whack-a-mole. Why don't people decide that Brenda, Arizona is the cool spot? I mean, Joshua Tree's nice and all, but this place has saguaros and spooky looking black rock constructed mountains. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. Is it hotter here longer? Is the heat it might be a little hotter, yeah. See, what is our altitude here? 1,570 feet. Okay. And some of these guys are just chewed the fuck up. Yeah. And I have the feeling that some of them that are closer to the road are chewed up by shotgun. Oh. Like David Grunman. I don't know what that means. The noxious little twerp. I don't know what that means. Play Sawaro by the Austin Lounge Lizards. Oh. You're quoting that song you yeah. sent me? Okay. Well. Now playing Saguaro by Austin Lounge Lizards on Apple Music. The daylight was a slipping through the mountains to the east. He grabbed his guns and he mounted up. He was off to say the least. He drove along in silence. A chill was in the air. The monsters had to be cut down or they'd soon be everywhere. His name was David Grunman, a noxious little twerp. Saw the giant plants as the Clanton gang and himself as Wyatt Earp. So he drove out to the desert, they wouldn't come to town. And Maricopa County, he vowed to shoot them down. Sequoia! Just a made-up story. No, nope. absolutely based on a true story, including the guy's name. Wow. What a douchebag. This is a little hard to admit for us Mojave Desert Rats with our love for Joshua Trees. But if there's a single plant that symbolizes the southwestern deserts, it would have to be the saguaro. No contest. And if you were looking for the epicenter of saguaro love in the desert, well, this is a biased opinion because it's one of my favorite places, but Tucson would have to be the epicenter for me. We sat down with our friend Audrey Shiri to talk saguaros in Tucson. 
Audrey's Instagram account, Old Pueblo Curiosities, is basically a love letter to Tucson, and we were stoked to hear what she had to say about America's tallest cactus. Audrey, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. What brought you to turn this into an Instagram feed? It was a pandemic hobby. Um, I was just kind of looking for ways to connect and get involved with the community. I had worked from home for quite a long time. And I just found that telling stories about local businesses was one way to do it. And then the more questions I asked, the more curious I got. And it's been fascinating. It's been about three years. And right at the beginning is where I actually came across you, Chris. I was asking what are the differences between all the yuccas in my neighborhood and I, I couldn't figure it out. I was searching everywhere on the internet. What is the alata? What is the brevifolia? Hmm. And then I thought I found a rostrata, which I had no idea, and nothing on the internet was being clear. And then I found your name, I found one of your blogs, and I thought, hey, why don't I just go straight to the expert? And I was just astonished that you replied. So thank you. I will remember that. And I've been learning from you ever since. I certainly have been enjoying the treatments you give to different local entrepreneurs and businesses and social services and things like that in Tucson, which is one of my favorite places. Is there a particular business that stands out to you as especially emblematic of Tucson that you've covered? And no fair saying to Marico because I've already eaten there. <laughs> I already know about them. Love to Marico. Emblematic of Tucson. I think what you would find with most visitors and people that live here, they just love the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. It's just that slice of the ecology, the art, the play place. They have a pack rat playhouse for kids. They can play on playground, pretend they're a pack rat. That's what first comes to mind as somewhere everyone has been or will visit when they come. That sounds amazing. I want to play in that pack rat uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exhibit. Yeah. And as somebody that's been going to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum for about 30 years at this point, it's Definitely an opinion I share, and it's totally on brand for this podcast, so that's great. <laughs> right. We had talked about having the Joshua Tree versus Saguaro smackdown as to which plant is more emblematic of the desert, and I think that's probably futile. Yeah, I think we all know who the icon is of the American Southwest. Yeah, we don't find cactus-oriented bars in South Dakota with neon Joshua trees on their sign. They're always Saguaros. You so. Know what else you don't have is uh, Joshua Tree cell towers, as far as I know. We do have saguaro cell towers here that are cartoonishly um, large and slightly, you know, shaped, I don't know, puffily. <laughs> wow. We are going to have to locate one of those on our next road trip. <laughs> yeah, for sure. They're, they're about 30 to 45 feet, I think I read. So smaller than the pine tree cell towers you'd see on the East Coast and around. But right about the right size for a saguaro. Let's see, one that is not yet 200 years old, but about to grow its first arm. East of here in Wonder Valley, there's a giant pine tree cell tower, and I'm pretty sure it has two palm tree cell towers with it. Mm -hmm. I think a swaro needs to join the cactus <laughs> garden. <laughs> that would be funny. Are you Tucson native or did you show up there from somewhere else? I'm a transplant from the East Coast. I have been here for about 15 years. Um, I left for the Peace Corps, came back. Um, so I've been here and it wasn't until a few years ago I really started digging in. It, com it completely grows on you. If you're someone who is a transplant, people find all the time they leave, they come back. It just holds a place in your heart. So we're here to talk about saguaros. I did bring you a list of facts. Some of them are fun facts. One that did come up since I'm saying I'm a transplant. Someone had mentioned that whenever people arrive, and this happened to me too, they didn't realize just how tall saguaros really are. You picture them, see them in movies. Even living here now, I kind of think of them as human-sized, eight feet tall, maybe just a little bit taller than us. But do you all know just how tall they get? 70 feet, I believe. Didn't I read something crazy? Like That sounds about right. Yeah. And I do have a lot of sources here. So Alicia, the National Park Service said the tallest saguaro measured was 78 feet tall. Yeah. Right on. Nice. So the reason I was asking, are you a Tucson native or transplant, was going to pave the way for, do you remember when you saw your first saguaro? I don't, but... I remember driving in. I was actually coming in from El Paso, um, where my family was living at the time. 
driving in and you start to see them pop up and it's majestic. It's like another land. And then the other memory I think many people have is the first time they drive west on Speedway, kind of out of town, over the hill into Gates Pass, which mm -hmm. is, it looks like another planet. It's just thousands and thousands of saguaros out in Saguaro National Park. It's mind-blowing. That's a favorite spot. Yeah, it's pretty striking. I think it was about 4.30 in the morning when I saw my first ones, just a little ways northwest of Wickenburg. And my then girlfriend had just driven off the road and scared the shit out of all of us. And the sun was coming up and there were saguaros and there was a coyote laughing at us. It was just really amazing. And we didn't die. So that, that was good. That's Is this where we all share our saguaro stories? <laughs> saguaro stories? Gather around. Um, I think both of you, you, you're, you said you transplanted from the East Coast. Mm hmm yeah, so I'm born in the American Southwest, born and raised. So I feel like I grew up with palm trees and swaros and creosote bush. And I don't even have a memorable first time story that I can think of. But I do remember as a kid, my mom took us to one of those caverns. You know, there's so many caverns across the American Southwest. I'm not sure which one it was. But I remember the, the road was just up and down those super intense hills. They're not like that here. Arizona seems to have a lot of these backcountry roads where it's like going over the hogbacks and you can get the roller coaster effect where you kind of lose your tummy when you're coming down the hill. And yeah, the forest of saguaros just all around was what really caught my attention. I was just a little kid riding this roller coaster like, whoa, this road is so much fun, but whoa, look at all these amazing cactus. You don't see for dense cactus forests very often and that was a really exemplary moment in my childhood i can still see it clear as day in my nice. mind's eye but our listeners can listen to us talk anytime they want and we have <laughs> you here for this special interview put me in coach where should we start i would love to start with this quote i found because alicia just mentioned the saguaro forest like you don't see this cactus forest and this one really spoke to me i think we can talk about it for a second um, this was from Arizona Highways. Lauren's Cheek had a little article, a thing or two about saguaros. So here's the quote. The saguaro forest seems eerie, not because these are strange plants, but because they don't read like plants at all. They seem individualistic and expressive in a way plants cannot be, an alien race of sentient being. I read that, totally agreed. It reminded me of um, back, I think it was in 2016, one of the local theaters here did a three-part event of Dancing with Saguaros. It was Standing with Saguaros. Folks were out in the forest doing this art and kind of communing with the Saguaros in a beautiful way. And you can still find videos of, of that online. But what do you all think? Sentient beings? Absolutely. I have been working with plants long enough so I don't see a real clear boundary between plants and mm -hmm. sentient beings. But I definitely get what the quote is referring to because it's, it's a weird feeling. It, Something that I learned in the process of uh, researching for this episode was how the native tribes that live in the American Southwest often view these larger figurehead plants as ancestors, as their own rightful sentient beings that were humanized in a way with such great reverence and respect. And I wish we felt that way about plants a little bit more seems like the ruthless destruction we see in, the, in a capitalist society can be so disheartening. But to look at every tree as, as a living relative of yours is a really beautiful thing. And the reverse, seeing people as trees. Yeah. Let's go down this rabbit hole. Let's keep it. <laughs> Ram Dass, let's go. <laughs> uh, you're hitting all my buttons. Do you have more facts that had to do with Native people's relationships with the saguaro? I thought it was important to talk about, so I, I brought a large um, paragraph I kind of wanted to read directly from the Desert Museum as well. But I, I just wanted to say that saguaros are respected and celebrated by all Tucsonans. If something happens to a saguaro, if, you know, if someone graffitis it, shoots it, whatever, we just wish every bad thing on them. But I do think, as Alicia was saying, it's, it's important to note the saguaro's vital relationship with indigenous people of the area in the Sonoran Desert. Um, so I, I just 
pulled a quote from some educational materials just for anyone who was listening who doesn't understand the relationship and just wanted the quick overview of just how important it is. But here you go. And you can find this on the Desert Museum's website. The saguaro cactus is an important source of food and shelter for many indigenous people in the Sonoran Desert for tribes such as the Tohono O'odham, who use saguaro ribs for constructing shade ramadas, fences, animal traps, and other implements. Many still gather saguaro fruits as their ancestors have for hundreds of years. For generations, the Tohono O'odham people have harvested saguaro fruits with long poles made of saguaro ribs. They eat the juicy fruit raw or cook it down into sweet, nutritious syrup. The dried seeds, rich in proteins and fats, can be ground into flour. The saguaro provides an abundant and important source of nutrients at a time otherwise scarce in desert food. The harvest tradition includes the fermentation of saguaro syrup to make a ceremonial wine used to herald in the monsoon rains. To the autumn, the saguaro is such an integral part of their world, it is regarded with the same respect given to people. Um, so I wanted to put that out there, and then you yeah. can learn more directly from the Tohono O'odham Nation. They have a cultural center and museum you can visit. Yeah, there's a wonderful passage in Gathering the Desert by Gary Nabhan about the ceremonial wine drinking and ushering in the monsoons. It's the most beautifully written essay about vomiting that I have mm -hmm. ever read in my exactly. life. And even if it wasn't for the vomiting part, it was still really cool. It was just mm -hmm. a loving and respectful take on this annual tradition. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a good read. Yep. And we do have our bookstore set up. Uh, I need to make sure that Gathering the Desert is prominently in there. You mentioned that uh, Tucsonans revere the, the saguaro, and it's mm -hmm. not at all surprising to me. I think we probably have a similar relationship with Joshua Trees here in the vicinity of mm -hmm. Joshua Tree. You, you have people coming out to shoot their music videos and hang things off Joshua Trees yeah. or spray paint them, and they immediately become persona non grata. Beheaded. Yeah. <laughs> or at least denied breakfast, for sure. Right, right. But Tucson is one of those southwestern cities that is growing. Mm -hmm. And that necessarily means displacing saguaros from time to time. How do, right. how do people in your town react to that kind of thing? Is that, is that sort of business as usual or is that increasingly unpopular? Or? Yeah, I think it's always sad to remove one because the danger is that they won't take to a new location. I have a couple of stories about this. Recently, it was earlier this year, um, a local golf course was being made, which is already somewhat negative in our minds. Um, and the folks working on it chopped down two saguaro side by side without a permit and someone caught it on camera. They were using a chainsaw and it just, there was this huge uproar. It was on all the local news. Arizona Department of Agriculture investigating after video shows a construction crew right here at a golf course in Tucson cutting down a pair of saguaros with chainsaws. Jerry Parker says he saw the iconic saguaros taken down firsthand. I was I was just taken. I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it happened. The video upsetting neighbors in the community. To see them uh, cut down for basically a three-day golf tournament and those guys after three days are going to pack up their things and be gone and these saguaros will be in a dumpster somewhere and I didn't like that and I hope the people in this community don't put up with it. And then on the other side of that I greatly respect a group called the Tucson Cactus and Succulent Society and they are a, a great resource for relocating cacti that need to be moved. They maintain a park called Pima Prickly Park where it's free. Um, you can go see all the types of cacti that they've transplanted and that they're growing. They've rescued over 123,000 native plants and saved them or provided new homes to them. And their volunteers have put in over 46,000 hours. So anyway, if you do have a cactus on your property that needs help, you should definitely look into the Tucson Cactus and Succulent Society. And we'll definitely link to them. Yes. So we kind of grazed over people doing things to cactus. Yes. Then I want to hear the dirt. What's the latest horror story beside this chainsaw incident? What are people right. still doing <laughs> to them after all these years? I'll start with this one from the 80s because a lot of people get a kick out of this and they're still talking about it on Reddit these days. Um, but one time 
a gentleman sort of near the Phoenix area, as I understand it, was shooting away at a cactus just for sport, um, shooting away at a large saguaro. One of the arms apparently broke off and then the whole cactus toppled over on him and crushed him and killed him. Well, you're slightly disadvantaged by the angle of the sun. But after all, the cactus wasn't packing any gun. His finger twitched, he made his move, he drew his guns, did bark. And echoed with the laughter as the bullets hit their mark. Well, the giant cactus trembled, then came that warning sound. The mighty arm of justice came hurling toward the ground. And the gunman staggered backwards, he whimpered and he cried. The sequaro crushed him like a bug, and David Grunman died. So that's a story we have. I was also looking at some headlines from over the years. There was a big one that kept coming up where a saguaro cactus impales car in Arizona crash. Now, this was a drunk driver who crashed into one. It came right through his windshield. And then in my further digging, the person that was working on his car then made a joke post on Craigslist about this car with a saguaro stuck in the windshield is for sale. And it, that went viral. So there, there are some pictures you can find of that. I did want to say, if, if people are not familiar, a, an arm of a saguaro is extremely heavy, like a tree branch. And if it falls, it, it's heavy enough to crush a vehicle. So that can definitely take you out. Yeah, it's basically the world's least fun water balloon. Yes. And to yep. that point, I did read um, that... Since, you know, saguaros are so tall, they're somewhat prone to lightning strikes, maybe not as much as other things, but they are, and they can actually explode because the water inside them boils. Is that true? Wow. Do you know about all of that? <laughs> it wouldn't shock me at all, yeah. but I, I, this is the first I'd heard of it. Oh, so let me give you a few more facts and just see what you think, uh, things that I found. So if a saguaro is moved, it is prone to getting a sunburn. So there are things that you need to do to to protect it. When we're waiting for the monsoon rains around June, early July, the saguaros, they get skinny, you know, and you can just tell they look really thirsty. So it's really exciting to me when we get the first dump of rain or two or three and they plump back up and you can just, you tell that they've sprung back to life. They look good. Everyone's, everyone's happy again. So, mm -hmm. so they do shrink down and then plump back up. Um, saguaros are on the Arizona license plate. I recently was thinking about all of the businesses in town that have saguaros as a part of their logo, and then I put a montage together. I just thought it was hysterical because you just kind of know a business is in Tucson because it's in their logo. Like, they use the cactus as a letter in the logo, like the T, or just they have funny things hanging off of it. So keep an eye out for that if you come visit Tucson. I think my favorite one of those that you talked about was yeah. the plumbing company where the saguaro mm -hmm. was made out of pipes. That's my favorite one. And I yeah. drive by that on my way to work. So there's there's a logo of a plumbing company. It's just pipes. And you can't see me, but I'm holding my arms up because, I don't know, a saguaro is just funny as pipes. It gets me every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing folks might not know is uh, a dead saguaro will will oftentimes remain standing and then the ribs stand there and kind of fountain out at the top and make a really neat spectacle. I was also reading that recently and probably over a longer time, but recently saguaro ribs are in high demand and people pay high value just because they can be used for a lot of things. I don't believe you're allowed to take saguaro ribs when you just see them somewhere, so check into that before grabbing and going. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, the Arizona state flower, is the saguaro blossom. These are ones that I actually polled people on Instagram. I just wanted to hear what they knew about saguaros, the people that live in Tucson. And one that came up is that the scientific name of the saguaro is, do you want to say it? Because I'm going to butcher it. Carnegie Gigantia. So it's named after Andrew Carnegie because of his support through the Carnegie Institution for the 1903 establishment of the Desert Botanical Laboratory in Tucson, um, which locals will know as the Desert Laboratory on the top of Tumamoc Hill. Yep. 
I feel like you've probably covered this a million times, but I do love this fact from Tucson Audubon that does claim that it is not just the most iconic symbol of our region. It is the icon winning over the Joshua tree. Um, But the saguaro serves as a source of food and shelter for over 100 different local species. And that's 32 species of birds. So that's just marvelous. That is really cool. Mm -hmm. I got to think that the inside of a saguaro would be fairly well insulated against temperature extremes, which is something that Mojave birds could definitely use because they're they're dying out because aside from burrowing owls and things like that, uh, the only animals that can get down under the soil and be insulated from the 123 degree heat are pretty much mammals and reptiles. And so birds are having a tough time in the Mojave and they could really use some saguaros to be a little bit more insulated housing. I think we have a campaign to launch Ah. planting more saguaros for wildlife habitat in the Mojave. We both planted them in our yard, so we're spearheading the effort. (laughs) All right, let me join in, except for I'm not in the Mojave. I will adopt one for you to plant in the Mojave. There you go. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And we can send you a Joshua tree. Oh, perfect. I would love that. I did see on this note, it passed by on LinkedIn. I'd have to go hunt it down. Um, And I think it was Tucson Audubon. A group was testing a nest box atop stilts, you know, kind of at the height of a saguaro, just to see, I think, if if birds would take to that and just as a kind of what if saguaros died out, what will the birds do and how can we help them? Um, but seeing that picture of just a wooden box on stilts with a thought that that would replace a saguaro was pretty heartbreaking. Humans just think they can terraform the world and that it'll just keep <laughs> functioning naturally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we see the folly of that. The house yeah. on sticks is a really sad mental sad. image. It would get hot, too. Yeah, yeah I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> what kind of insulation did they use in that right. little plywood box? Because mm-hmm. that's not going to match up to the, the beautiful, calm core of a suara. Totally. I'm, I'm down to a last few facts. One that I did enjoy was that the every 10 years, the Saguaro National Park leads a saguaro census so the last one was in 2020 and they found that in saguaro national park there are about two million saguaros nice that was that was nice to know significant (laughs) yeah and it's a great national park but it's not all that huge so it says something about how many saguaros are in arizona and sonora and that tiny little sliver of california where they show up Mm -hmm. it's uh it's Definitely a lot of sorrows in the world, it would seem. Yep. If if someone such as yourselves, not in the Tucson, Sonoran Desert area, wants to adopt a saguaro, there is a program for that by the Friends of Saguaro National Park at friendsofsaguaro.org. But proceeds help with saguaro research and protection activities. Nice. We'll definitely have that link in the show notes. Yep. You can go out and adopt yourself a saguaro. Yeah. One other... Interesting thing I knew about for a while and finally recently was able to make my way out there. It's kind of on the northwest side of Tucson. In that Pima Prickly Park I mentioned by the Tucson Cactus and Succulent Society is something called Saguaro Henge. And so it's like Stonehenge, but there are Uh. eight saguaros in a ring. And it was designed years ago by a late landscaped architect as a tribute to his mother. And then they, they built the park around it. This, this predated the park. But there's a plaque there that says, Saguaro Henge, celebrating the nurturing relationship between plants and people. It's a beautiful spot to visit. I will definitely have to check that out. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because there are just so many saguaros out at the park that you can walk through and take a hike and walk through them. But something about seeing eight in a ring, you know, put there in an intentional way, it just makes you sit and contemplate and meditate a bit. Yeah, that's great. I am getting, it would be wrong to call it homesick, but I'm getting something like that for Tucson as we speak. It's always been one of my favorite places. I've always felt like it. If I die and I've never lived in Tucson, I'm kind of doing it wrong. You know, my wife and I were there in, in December for about a week. And it's just really good to get some time in among the saguaros and the ocotillos. And... It's a special place. <clears throat> so uh, Crested 
Swaros have not come up yet. Oh, I left it out and I just closed the tab. Alicia, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I did I, want to <laughs> tell you. <laughs> I did want to tell you that there is an organization. Um, I believe the original members were based around Tucson. It's not really clear right now because it's an online group, but there's an organization called the Crested Saguaros Society. So first of all, maybe you tell us about Crested Saguaros and then I'll fill you in with the details about the society. Oh no, please tell us all about <laughs> it, girl. You're the professional here. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not the professional, but Crested Saguaros are a type of saguaro that grows in an odd way. Um, the top ends up looking really mashed together in a crustate fashion. So they're crested in that they don't have long arms. Maybe they have some arms, but the top of it looks kind of like a crown. And so these are really special. And often folks will say, if you find one, don't tell other people where it is because there are other people that will go and want to take it. So it's, it's somewhat secretive. But there's a group called the Crested Saguaro Society, which was formed in 2006. And they go out and locate these crested saguaros. I don't know that they share the GPS coordinates, but they take photos, they document, and they kind of keep everything in a database. And you can go to their website, which is crestedsaguarosociety.org. And that is an online community of dedicated naturalists who volunteer time and resources to learn about and share observations on crested saguaros and other mutated cactus. So they've documented over 3,200 crested saguaros. And you can actually wow. read about them. They were featured in the Wall Street Journal and something else. It was probably At Atlas Obscura. Like It's mm -hmm. a really neat group. <laughs> that sounds so cool. I'm definitely going to be checking that out because... I love crested squirrels. I think they're gorgeous. Yeah. Nothing like a genetic mutation to make you special. Yep. <laughs> That's why she hangs out with me. <laughs> um, so summing all this up, if we had a listener who was really, really impatient and was sort of hitting fast forward and got to this part and you have the chance to just in a couple of sentences sum up why it's a good thing that saguaros exist on the planet in this one special part of the planet known as the Sonoran Desert. How would you explain that to them? Sure. I think not only are they iconic and a wonder of the world, you know, they're such a vital piece of our desert ecology here in the Sonoran Desert that if they didn't exist, we don't really know what that would change. I mean, maybe some people do, but it would, it, it would be drastic. Mm-hmm. Like imagining, uh, I don't know, Holland without tulips or uh, maybe more like Turkey without tulips because that's where they're native to. Sequoia National Forest. Oh, yeah, there you go. Sequoias. <laughs> we, for work, we had a trip to Redwood National Park last week to have a retreat and meeting and some hiking. And I tried to get people to name all of the national parks that were named after plant species. And uh, nobody wanted to play along. but. <laughs> It's uh, there. There are only a few, you know, uh, Joshua Tree being one and Redwood and Sequoia National Parks, both and Saguaro, obviously. Um, and then you get into the BLM National Monuments and it just goes crazy. You well, know? that just doesn't count. Yeah. We're Ironwood, doing National Park or bust. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's why nobody wanted to play with Chris. Yeah. We started including Game all time. the BLM. Well, Chris, if someone is coming into town, they may not realize that that Saguaro National Park is divided into two parks, east and west, that are split by the city of Tucson in the middle. Um, a lot of folks like to visit the west side because the visitor center is somewhat grander. But check out both sides, east and west. I will confess I've only been in the western Tucson Mountains part. I've not visited the east side yet. Busted. Yep. <laughs> that, that, Called that, that. it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you did. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I've been nearby Sabino Canyon, et cetera, and it's a lovely part of the world. But yeah, I need to get into that that unit of the park for sure. Well, as a central to east sider of Tucson, you're welcome anytime. Excellent. <laughs> Audrey Sherry, Old Pueblo Curiosities on Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, really generous of you to spend some of your time and this has been fun. It was a blast. Thanks for having me.
We want to thank Hank Card and the Austin Lounge Lizards for letting us excerpt their song Sawaro, which is off the band's 1984 album Creatures from the Black Saloon. Thanks also to Fox 5 Tucson for the use of their report on the golf course Saguaro Chainsaw Massacre. If you want to check out the Saguaro Fruit Wine Ceremony essay in Gary Nabhan's book The Desert Smells Like Rain, go to 90milesfromneedles.com slash books. There are a lot of other good books available there on desert topics as well. And to join the growing group of supporters of 90 Miles from Needles, without whom we could not produce this show, go to 90milesfromneedles.com slash donate. 90 Miles from Needles is a production of the Desert Advocacy Media Network. And thanks for listening. We love you. See you next time. taking a different highway from here Mm -hmm. and this is quartzite this is quartzite it's been a while since i've been here do not take me to a rock shop just asking for trouble